ended up talking about this uh, passage um, about justice, uh, where Nietzsche is saying that a common these days understanding of justice, of the origins of justice, is in the reactive emotions and resentment. So that justice is thought to be um, what we strive for when we feel we've done, been done wrong and we want revenge, we want justice. Um, and there's a sense in which uh, that, that understanding of justice as being connected to feelings of resentment is the moralized way of understanding this. Um, but Nietzsche is pointing to a different understanding of justice, one which he obviously is praising, in which, it, in which justice is representing exactly the fight against those kinds of reactive emotions. Um, and so this is this amazing passage, um, 48 to 49 in section 11, where he says, if it really happens that the just man remains just, even toward those who injure him, and not merely cold, moderate, distant, indifferent, being just is always a positive way to get him. So, uh, not merely cold or indifferent, in other words, this person genuinely feels wrong, right? And so there's a hot passion welling up within him. And yet, if it really happens that he remains just, even towards those who injure him, if the high, clear objectivity of the just eye, the judging eye, does not cloud, even under the assault of personal injury, derision, accusation, well then, that is a piece of perfection and high mastery on earth, and one that's pretty rare. We shouldn't expect it too often. So here, on this uh, other understanding of justice, it's maintaining a kind of objectivity, a kind of clear vision of the objective circumstances or facts, even when one's emotional life is brought up. Um, so his point here is that understanding justice as vengeance or revenge or an ex expression of resentment is itself um, a kind of reactive attitude. And this is one that's characteristic of morality. This is part of the moral system of values. You should be thinking back to uh, the order in which morality thinks of the relationship between good and evil, or evil and good. And so uh, in the first treatise, we saw that the moral system of values starts with what it rejects, starts with identifying certain things and people as evil, and then in reaction to that, affirm something as good, namely the opposite of what it takes to be evil. So it's reactive in that way, not affirmative, not primarily affirmative. Okay, and then we uh, saw at the very end last time, he thinks that there are various uh, strategies that societies have adopted in order to push individuals in the direction of this kind of objectivity to develop individuals who are able to see these kinds of relationships um, objectively as opposed to seeing them resentfully. And there are various things before he concludes that the most important social innovation for helping us achieve that kind of objectivity to put aside our feelings of revenge and vengeance, resentment, is law. So law precisely is going to take out of the wronged, the hands of the wronged individual, uh, the proper remedy. 
um, it makes it precisely uh, an objective mechanism. Um, so, contrary to the thought that justice and right and law are generated by feelings of resentment and vengeance and revenge, justice is actually, justice and law are actually ways of countering these. Um, and uh, I guess I just want to say one more time, this is Nietzsche giving like the highest praise possible to these things, um, to these uh, mechanisms to achieve objectivity in the face of personal uh, resentment. Any questions about that? Okay, so on to section 12, on to punishment specifically. Um, and here he starts off talking about punishment, but his point is more general. And the first point that he's making here about punishment really is a point that can be applied to any kind of social practice or institution also. Section 12. Get a word on the origin and purpose of punishment. The origin and purpose of punishment. These are two problems that fall out or, out or ought to fall out separately. Unfortunately, they are often lumped together. The origin and purpose of punishment. So what Nietzsche is saying here is that the origin and the current purpose or meaning of punishment in this case, but in general, the origin and the current meaning or purpose of a social practice are different and may need to be understood to be different. Um, he says that, um, bottom of page um, 50, he says that the cause, sorry, uh, there's no more, it says, there's no more important proposition than that, than that one which is gained with such effort, but also really ought to be gained, so he's endorsing this. Namely, here's what is so important that we keep in mind, that the cause of the genesis of a thing and its final usefulness, its actual employment and integration into a system of purposes, lie toto caelo apart, so it's like worlds apart, heavens apart. Um, that something extant, something that is somehow or other coming to be, is again and again interpreted according to new views, monopolized in a new way, transformed and rearranged for a new use by a power superior to it. Um, it gets arranged by means of which the previous meaning and purpose must of necessity become obscured or entirely extinguished. However well, one, however well one has grasped the utility of some physiological organ or a legal institution, a social custom, a political practice, a form in the arts or in religious cult, basically any kind of social practice at all, however well one has grasped the meaning or value of those social practices for us today, one has still not comprehended anything regarding its genesis. Okay, so this is what I described a while ago as the genetic fallacy. So here he's saying that understanding the meaning and purpose and value something has for us today doesn't give us insight into its origin. And the converse is also true. Also, understanding the origin of something, how it came about, doesn't give us insight into the meaning or usefulness or value or purpose or function for us today. That the same uh, external practice, so to speak, can have, and does have, lots of different meanings or purposes or values in different circumstances. Um, on the other hand, 
Nietzsche is interested in identifying the origin of morality. He's interested in the practices which gave rise to them. Now, strictly speaking, and I think he thinks this, understanding the origin of morality doesn't give us itself, uh, isn't, isn't a good enough reason to re reject it. So the origin of a practice um, doesn't tell us what its meaning or value, what meaning or value it has for us today. So just because the origin of morality is in something other than a meaning that we now attribute to it, that itself doesn't show us that morality should be rejected to that. It still could have value and meaning. So why is Nietzsche interested in genealogy? So why is he interested in tracing the history of the development of uh, the values of morality? Well, I think there are two reasons. One is um, to help us understand what it is that um, morality system of moral values is a complicated system of different strands that have their meanings and uh, value changing over time. And so to sort out uh, the different strands so that we can better understand what morality is, we need to trace these strands back through their histories. This will also help us understand um, the worry about the collapse of morality. But still, that's not Nietzsche's rejection. It's still not going to tell us um, why we should reject it. Um, but the second point is this. Um, if we think of morality as divine, if we think of it as otherworldly and permanent, unchanging and without a history, um, we're going to be less inclined to be able to doubt it, to be able to question it, to be able to challenge it. If we see it as a human creation that changes and develops over time as different meanings may be well adapted to one circumstance but not another, then we'll be in a position to critique it. We'll be able to be more likely to challenge it and reflect on whether, in fact, those values are the ones that we want to affirm. And finally, um, keeping in mind the genetic fallacy keeping in mind the idea that the origin of something doesn't show its current usefulness or meaning. Still, I think Nietzsche would say that the, when we look at the origin of morality, when we see that it's not given by God, it's not otherworldly, it's a human creation, we'll, we're going to raise suspicions so um, the fact that um, the fact that the origins of morality are brutal and ugly that we just been emphasizing. Um, this doesn't show that it morality hasn't created things of value, but it will prompt us, he thinks, to raise suspicions. Okay, and so this is what we're um, looking at. Okay, so uh, with respect to um, social practices and punishment in particular, there are going to be, he thinks, two aspects um, that we need to um, keep in mind are distinct.